My name is Ndidi Okonkwo Muneli. I'm a social entrepreneur based in Lagos, Nigeria. Okay, what are my expectations? So I'm really expecting to have fun, to share my experiences, and to learn from the experiences of others. Ndidi Muneli is the managing partner of Sahel Consulting, which works across West Africa, unlocking agriculture. She is also the co-founder of AAC Foods, which was established in 2009 to fight malnutrition, reduce post-harvest losses among smallholder farmers, and displace imports. She is the founder of Leap Africa, which inspires, empowers, and equips a new cadre of principled, disciplined, and dynamic young leaders in Africa. Ndidi started her career as a management consultant with McKinsey and Company, working in their Chicago, New York, and Johannesburg offices. She holds an MBA from Harvard Business School and an undergraduate degree with honors from the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. She was a senior fellow at the Mosava Romani Center for Business and Government at the Harvard Kennedy School and an Aspen Institute New Voices Fellow. Ndidi was recognized as a young global leader by the World Economic Forum and received the national honor from the Nigerian government. She was listed as one of the 20 youngest power African women by Forbes. She serves on the boards of Nestle Nigeria PLC, Nigerian Breweries PLC, Heineken, Godrej Consumer Products Limited India, Fairfax Africa Holdings Canada, Royal DSM Sustainability Board Netherlands, the Center for Memories and the African Philanthropy Forum. Ndidi is the author of Social Innovation in Africa, A Practical Guide for Scaling Impact, published by Rutledge. She's a TED Global Speaker, and her work has been featured on CNN, BBC, and a range of international and local media outlets. Ladies and gentlemen, Ndidi Muneli. Good evening. I actually, I'm not usually nervous when I speak, but after Michael Smith, I'm going to be a letdown. I don't have his pizzazz or his muscles. So just manage me the way you see me, please. All right, so I have a, um, a presentation as well, and I'll just run through it. So the, question, the first question, this is a very uh, happy clicker. The first question is, who am I? I'm a social entrepreneur. I'm also a mother and a wife, a Nigerian, a Christian, and um, someone who believes that life is short, so you have to make a difference. And one of the things that I committed to was basically to find value and impact wherever I can. Um, and about 10 years ago, God laid an idea in our hearts to start a company called Ace Foods. Some of you have heard of Ace Foods. I hope all of you have used that product. How many of you have used that product? If you haven't, you're missing, you're missing, you're missing. <laughs> anyway, so we started a company called Ace Foods. We actually applied for a business plan competition and won. And we're one of the uh, 14 finalists. And the company was really set up to do a couple of things. First, to address the high rates of malnutrition in the country. When we started, it was 41% of our children were malnourished. That's one out of every three. And when you're malnourished, it affects brain development. The second reason was because 40 to 60% of fruits and vegetables go to waste. And uh, just couldn't understand why we had such a high rate of waste. And then the third was that whenever I went to our grocery stores, I only saw imported products. And as a child, I remember eating made in Nigeria, proudly Nigerian products. And so we wanted to address this issue. So we started a company called Ace Foods. Now, when we started, and when we actually won the business plan competition, our first products were going to be jams. Do you know jams? How many of you use jam today when you ate your bread? Huh? So we were going to create jams, and I like jam. My mother is American. I'm sure some of you have guessed. So I used to eat jam growing up in my fridge. And we used to have mango jam. Pa pa pineapple jam, papaya jam, and there's even abalumo jam. In fact, abalumo jam, or we call it udala jam, is actually the best jam because it doesn't require pectin, and it's actually phenomenal. And I used to live in Senegal, actually. The idea for Ace Foods came when we lived in Senegal. 
And during our time in Senegal, there was Bisap Jam. Bisap is actually Zobo. And you'd go to the hotels there and you'd see all the array of little, little jars of jam. And so we won this business plan competition with actually creating these little jars of jam with, uh, you know, an- Ankara on top and a ribbon, you know, saying this is what we could do. We can process our fruits and vegetables that go to waste. And so when we started Ace Foods, with this, winning this business plan competition, our first products were jams. And then you can imagine what happened, right? First of all, it took us a year to get NAVDAC numbers. We invested in all the equipment for jam production. Um, and then we came to our average Nigerian with our pineapple, abalumo, mango, papa, or papaya jam. And they said, it's not red. <laughs> what type of jam is red now? Strawberry jam. Okay, where do you get strawberries in Nigeria? In Joss, but, you know, they can't even fill a basket to produce jam. So the first thing is that all my, you know, 1% friends, like who live in Banana, loved the ba- pineapple jam, right? We, in fact, were selling a lot of it in Quintessence and other places. The expatriates were so excited about these uh, products. But we wanted to create a product that would address the malnutrition challenges and support our farmers. So I wasn't creating a product for 0.05% of the population. So that was the first problem, is that there was no demand. So we said, okay, we'll have to create a red jam. That's what Nigerians want. So we came up with a mixed fruit jam that had pineapple, uh, oranges, and a range of other fruits, and a, a little red coloring, because watermelon... Watermelon, which was now the basic component, is not a very bright color. I'm sure you've seen watermelon jam. It's not, I mean, watermelon juice is not very strong and potent. And then, so we took it around, and people said they like it, you know, but the price point was very, very high, because we realized that most people who actually buy jam in Nigeria don't realize that the jam that's imported is actually flavored water with sugar. So when you start putting fruits into products, the cost of it basically goes up. But that wasn't even the the only problem. Jam is usually in glass jars. And in Nigeria, there are two major companies that produce glass. And they have orders for the next 10 years because their biggest customers are Nigerian breweries and Nigerian bottling company. So we went to visit them and they said, guys, if you're going to, we're going to take your order, we, you know, get a mold, but you have to at least commit to 1 million jars. And we could not commit to 1 million jars. So we started going to dump sites around Lagos to basically collect jars. And we were sterilizing them and recycling them. But then we completed all the dump sites and got all the jars that were possibly there. And there were no more jars available to us. (laughs) So then we started using plastics. But then when you use plastics, the shelf life is much shorter, between three to six months. So you can't get it very far and it's limited. The third challenge that we faced beyond the packaging was that when we wrote our business plan, sugar was 6,000 naira a bag. But as you know, in Nigeria, we have a monopolistic um, industry. So the sugar price went from 6,000 naira a bag to 12,000 naira a bag overnight. I even approached one of the monopolists to ask what happened, because I've looked at the global prices. It has not doubled. It's gone up by 6%. Why is it doubling in Nigeria? But that's a story for another day. And then the the fourth challenge was that after we looked at everything, we said, okay, maybe we can just do bulk and supply to, you know, the fast food companies that make donuts, the bakeries that make, uh, you know, have a layer of jam. But the challenge with all of them is that they said, you know, it has to be 2,000 naira per kg. So you can't use fruits. And we looked back to our mission and our vision and said, the time we start producing water and sugar and flavoring, How are we helping the agricultural sector? How are we improving the nutritional status of our people? If nothing else, we're actually killing our people. So, was it a fuck up? Yes. (laughs) I've never used that word, or very, very rarely. Okay, so it was a product failure, one full year. One full year. Now, if you were me, would you close down the company? Maybe. It's tough, right? It's tough. You often wonder, What's the point of this? The stress, the drama, the constant going back to the drawing board to tweak your business model. And I can tell you many entrepreneurs say, you know what, it's not worth it. And at that time, my husband and I, who, you know, 
have got some pretty decent education, decided to start this company, and what our salary was, at the, both of us was 50,000 naira. So we, were, we, we, we wrote a letter to ourselves, you know, with our salary, 50,000 naira, sweat equity for 50,000 naira, and we had children, so you can imagine. Very easy to go back to what you know. He's a finance guy, I'm a strategy person. Let's just forget this. It was a nice experiment, nice business plan competition. Move on. So what was the impact of it? Lost time. I mean, you spent a year trying to build something, obtaining an AVDAC number. Lost resources. You spent a lot of money on equipment, and then obviously wasted materials, labels, branding, etc. And packaging, because you actually do labels, you package, you buy everything in bulk. Okay, so what would we have done differently? The first thing is invest in robust market research. You know, I always tell people, your community of friends is not enough to tell you something will sell. Uh, winning a global business plan competition is not enough. You actually have to test the people in Mushi, Ajegunle, uh, Bariga, uh, Kanu. Do you understand? All over the country. Understand what their price point is, what their pain point is, and whether they're willing to. My dream was that all the women who carry bread on their head, when they carry mayonnaise and butter, they'll carry my jam. That was my dream, right? They're not carrying it today. The truth is, the reality is that this was not something that they were used to, and it was not something they were going to get used to anytime soon. Even those who have introduced new products like instant noodles, which used to be alien to us, it takes time to change mindsets about what is appropriate and what is useful. The second is, stall large-scale investments. Stall NAVDAC, stall all these large-scale investments. Clearly, you can't sell in a supermarket without a NAVDAC number, but there are other ways to test the product without making the investments required because you really lose a lot when you do that. What next? So our year three strategy in our business plan was spices. And after year one went horribly wrong, we decided, you know what, we're going to start with spices. So we quickly became a spice company. Now we are adding new products to it. So today we actually have about 30 SKUs and 14 products in the market. And if you guys have never used the products, you're missing. Because we're in all the major supermarkets, we're in ShopRite, we're in Spa, we're in Eban, or we're in Globus, we're in all of them. And we now sell quite widely. And then we have our bean flour, our soya maize, which fights moderate malnutrition, which is a complete meal. Um, and we're in 10 states. Uh, we export to the Netherlands and to the United States. Um, we have about 80 full-time employees. I don't work at the company full-time. I'm just a director. And we have all young people running the company, and they're doing a phenomenal job. And we've won quite a few awards, which I'm grateful for. We made in Nigeria Product of the Year, et cetera, et cetera, by Ebony Life. So my big takeaway for you is this. I love this quote that says, success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. Sorry, the, the words are a bit messed up. But that's a really important thing just to dwell on for a second. Because you can be successful. So Ace Foods is now winning awards. We can dwell on it and then one day miss the mark. Because you have to const constantly innovate. In fact, so many new people have entered the market. Every day we have new competition. Right? Even some of the people we supply to and we... If you think you haven't eaten Ace, if you eat many of the fast food companies, we actually supply in bulk, in 25 kg bags, to many of the fast food companies, many of the noodle companies, um, and quite a few of the people that you know, um, large multinationals, use us for their inputs. But many of them are now going into our space, right? And many of our suppliers are now going into our space. We work with 10,000 farmers. Some of our customers are saying, let's go directly to the farmer. So if you're not innovative and you're not cutting edge, you can become a failure, right? So it's really important that you don't dwell on it because success is not final. And that's very important. The second is failure is not fatal. If we had given up after that one year, many people said give up. This is not for you. You didn't study agriculture. You didn't study food technology. No quality control background, no microbiology background. I'm a business person. My husband is a business person. He's a finance person. I'm a strategy person. What are you doing in food? And a lot of people used to be very embarrassed that we have entered this space. After I had two degrees, he went to Harvard, I went to Harvard, Harvard Business School, and you're selling, spice, you're selling jam. You know what I mean? So that mindset. So just keep in mind that success is not final and failure is not fatal. It's the courage to continue that counts. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Okay. okay. My name is Mayoa. Um, my question to you is, um, you said you didn't have any expertise in the food industry. You said you didn't have any expertise. Did you employ people that had the expertise for that? I mean, you don't want to spend more money. I mean, you don't want to invest too much. So that's my question. Yeah, so when I say I didn't have expertise, I had worked as a consultant for large companies in food. So I understood the food industry, but I didn't understand product development or quality control. And so from the beginning, we set up a board. And I always tell young entrepreneurs, set up a board. You know, that's my mantra. So on our board, we had people with quality control and food technology experience. And we also hired staff who had that experience. But it's so important to have that at board level. Otherwise, those, your staff can also mislead you. And so it's important to have the experience um, at the board level. Um, and then it's also important to, to study and commit to lifelong learning and surround yourself with people who have done the same thing. So I have a lot of friends in this industry within Nigeria, but also globally. And that really helped. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Catherine. Uh, awesome presentation. I want to ask you, one of your points, one of your learning points was don't make too, um, large investments and you can store your NAVDAQ registration process. So if you store this process, can you actually push your product to the market without NAVDAQ number? And if you don't, I mean, there are some investments that are unavoidable because you need to buy your mesh, packaging machines and all those materials that require you to actually push out the product. So those things are unavoidable. There are also costs that you have to incur. That so, like, is there a way around that? So I definitely think a, a, an easy answer is always start as small as possible. Now, what a lot of people are doing now is that they're even approaching us to say, "Can you contract manufacture for us?" Do you understand? So that we have to get the NAVDAC number for them. And we, have to, we already have the machines we can use. So as much as possible, shift the risk to somebody else. So contract manufacturing is one approach. Another approach is to say, can I rent equipment? Or can I, use, um, can I avoid investing in a lot of packaging material and start with small quantities? Because the truth is, you don't know how it's going to pan out. So half of our factory in year two were museums of equipment that we purchase that we'll never use. And literally, who are you selling it to? Jam processing equipment. There's nobody else in this market that wants to buy it. And so you're literally, you've literally wasted money. So as much as possible, see how you can actually partner with others who are doing something similar. A third approach is actually to see if you can actually import something that you want to sell and see if there's a ready market for it here. Um, and so some people do that. They start off importing. And then if there's an interest, then they actually uh, invest in local manufacturing. So that's another option. Awesome. Thank you. Very, very practical. So we'll take the third and final question. Good evening. My name is Kile Chiuchena. Fantastic presentation. Um, I run two, three businesses with my wife. You know, and, uh, we're, st we're early. We've done like two years. I know your business has run for like five, six years. Am I right? Like, almost 10. Almost 10 years. And <laughs> I kind of look into the future and I'm like, when the, as the business grows, and this is my wife, were there, are there, were there challenges, were there times when it was tough running a business with your husband in terms of, you know, decisions, when you guys quarrel, you have to go to the office the next day, how do you look at yourself, <laughs> you know? So sometimes I'm like, and there's another thing that I'm, I, I'm, I really worry about because, you know, staff are very funny. People like to look for favors in, in a business. So my people want to be with our guy's side, so we want to be on Madame's side. So people want to just cause problems, you know, so what advice, what was it like and how did you manage it? So it's a very good question and it was extremely tough. In fact, at some point we had to say, is it our marriage or the business? I mean, it was that tough. Um, so we went to meet a couple, the Ayenis, they started tantalizers together. And we had to go for counseling. How are you guys doing it? And they said, divide up the work. And that helped. They said, divide up the work, don't challenge each other when it comes to your... Once you've divided, you've, the division has occurred, stick to it. So my husband is in charge of finance and operations. That's what he oversees. I oversee HR and marketing. And we don't get into each other's spaces. But I tell you, as a woman, as a woman who is now over 40, you have to have wisdom. My husband is chairman, chairman, chairman. <laughs> so it means that... Uh, 
you know, if I'm going to disagree with him, it's not in public. I'm, I've learned the hard way because I used to be a fireball. And you can ask the staff who work with us. They'll tell you that we're very professional. You know, we are professional at work. Business is business. And there are very few times when we let uh, work get into our marriage. And now we've been married for 18 years. And we'll celebrate our 50th wedding anniversary by God's grace. So that's, that's really... So you have to use wisdom. Tell your wife to call me. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. God bless you. No, we have time for one more. One more. Just one more question. Ladies, though, chairman, chairman, chairman. There you go. <laughs> okay. Hi, my name is Alero. It was a really good presentation. Thank you. I'm, I'm just interested, as a strategist, didn't you do any research and a business plan? Because if you did, I'm just, from the glass jars to what people want, I would assume those would be one of the things that would come up. Yeah, so we wrote an award-winning business plan. <laughs> I told you we won a global competition, USCID MasterCard. And guess what? We're one of the few businesses that won that competition that are still standing today. How many of you know we can write business plans? <laughs> uh -uh, I know how to write a business plan. We did research, my dear. But it's the question is, did I go to Shomolu and ask them if they'll buy jam? Eh? And at what price point? So all the people that we did research, the data that's publicly available, tells you that this is a winning strategy. You have 40 to 60% of fruits and vegetables going to waste. Any other country, the first way they start with food processing is canning and putting stuff in jars. Do you understand? Because that's how you preserve. You don't, and in other countries it works. But in this country, maybe five years from now, somebody will be successful with a jam company. But at that time, it shocked us, right? That all the research we did, even when you go and talk to the glass companies, will they produce for you? Of course they'll say yes. At what price point? Yes, bring the mold. But when you now come to say, I have an order, they'll say 500 jars, please. You have to wait for two years. They will we'll do it, but they said we should wait for two years before they can produce. At some point, we're now bringing in glass jars from Ghana. So trust me, I know how to do business plans. Still today, we do business plans. But there's, and I always tell people, that's why you have to have plan A, plan B, plan C. So our three, year three strategy was to invest, do spices. Do you understand? Year four, snacks. Year five. So by then, we had to say, you know what? Let's quickly move to our year three strategy and skip. Year two was baby food. We're still coming there. We have a dry baby food, but I wanted to make pureed carrots and sweet potato. You know? <laughs> the, because guess what? Gerba. How many of you know that instant thing that you're opening? All imported. You carry, I mean, I had a little child. I'll be bringing in sweet potato and chickpeas. When this stuff grows here and it's fresh and it's and we actually tried. We did all of that. But then you don't want to put in preservatives into baby food. And trust me, my sister, the ideas are many and plenty. But Nigerian consumers, my grandmother used to look at spaghetti when we ate it in our house and say, ah, worms, who will ever eat this? Today, you guys, who has not eaten spaghetti in the last one week or Indomie? So there's, you can change consumer behavior, but it takes a huge investment in marketing, uh, the right price point, scale, and lots of money. And if you don't have it, it's tough. All right. Thank you, guys. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, I think it's always a challenge to reflect on someone's journey and to be honest about the mistakes they made, the failures they had, and what they learned from them. So this experience has been quite exhilarating, and I hope that I've been able to inspire others. Um, that you can fail forward, learn from your failures, try not to repeat them, and keep pushing forward in spite of the obstacles.